الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So last week we were on ayah number 8 and I told you that I'm going to break it into two parts. The first part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says was kurisma rabbik and the second part is watabattal ilayhi tabatila. Uh, and remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with exclusive devotion. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his name, through tasbihat, through salah, through reading of the Quran, and of course, you do munajah, talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is also zikrullah. And along with that, we talk about dua in great detail, uh, because we need to understand the concept of dua, especially at the time of tahajjud, where we know that the chances of your dua being manifested are really, really high, but we have to understand the whole dynamics behind the duas. Um, so there are certain things uh, which would make our duas more powerful, just as you know, if you have a tool in your hand, how you aim, what you shoot, ba is based on the person who's holding the tool. So what are the qualities, what are the things, attributes that we need to have within ourselves when we are making a dua for it to become a very powerful, effective dua. And we talked about various things, like you know how sincerity makes a difference, how repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we talked about using Allah's name and attributes. We also talked about making dua at the right place and at the right time. So we did this part. And along with this, we also understood that there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us immediately whatever we ask for and exactly in the way that we have asked for. But there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, plans to give us exactly what we want, but there is a delay and there is a good solid wisdom, a series of wisdom behind the delay. Okay? And the third thing is what? That there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, plans to grant us something which is slightly different but it surely is more beneficial for us in this dunya and akhara, right? So there are various ways in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would manifest your dua. Allah does listen to our duas, but the way he responds can be different. Achha. But, you know, having said that, there are a certain things that we need to be very, very careful about because this can hinder between you and manifestation of your dua. And we did two things in it. A is what? Making inappropriate dua. What does that mean? That I make dua for something which is sinful. I make dua for something which is going to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, of course, there is a very high chance that Allah will not uh, accept or answer to that dua. And even if he does, that's like a worse situation to be in. Why? Because if he is giving, if he is facilitating you to carry on with that sinful deed, that is a sign of hopelessness of Allah, uh, you know, with you. We can't be hopeless about anybody, but Allah knows in and out. He knows that even if we get to live for thousands of years, we are going to end up being a kafir or being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that we don't want to be. And the Arabic word, I mean, just for you to kind of like, you know, just hear it out is... Istadraj. Istadraj is when you're sinning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates you more to sin more and more and get further and further away from deen and Allah, right? The second is what having weak faith. Now, there can be two aspects of this. One is that you kind of doubt your own dua. You're not serious about your own dua. You're making dua, but you're kind of like, you know, a little jittery. You're unsure. You're just doing it because you and I should be doing it. And a good solid example of something that we repeatedly, uh, you know, uh, make dua for, and that is Idina Surat al-Mustaqim. How many of us, us actually really want Hidayah? I know a lot of people who are too scared 
to like, you know, really beg Allah for hidayah because they know there's a lot of other challenges. There are a lot of giving up of this dunya, pleasures of this dunya that come, with the, that are part and parcel of it. So they're a little reluctant. They're saying it, but they don't really mean it. And likewise, sometimes you make dua for other people, kisi na ke kaam ili dua karna, and then you know, oh, kaha tha, I have to make that dua. Likewise, sometimes you make dua for Muslim ummah, somebody in Syria, you know, people who are really, really struggling hard, and you know, they're sacrificing so much for their to to stand, you know, take a stand for the religion. We do it, but we don't, we can't empathize with them. O karna Syria ke liye to kar liya. You know, that kind of a thing. So, of course, um, we should, whenever we make dua, we must A, have, you know, be very, very serious about what I'm asking from Allah. And B, also understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely capable of giving what I'm asking for. You should have complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, he has to say kun and it's going to happen. So, weak faith in how I'm asking and weak faith in... Now, Zubillah, capabilities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to manifest your du'as. Both things can hinder in Allah basically answering your du'as. The third thing is what? Sinful actions. If you are committing certain sins in your life, along with making du'a, for example, you're backbiting, you're committing adultery, you are hurting others, it can block your du'as. Right? It could be any sin. Serious major sin, but yes. And I'm going to, I know, if this is the, when I was just like, kind of going through this, I said, like, oh my God, how do I become sin-free? Yeah? yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Fourth thing is what? Consuming haram things, eating or drinking haram things, or you, you know, uh, uh, the wealth that you acquire is from haram sources. Any of these may not, you know, uh, you know, your du'as may not be accepted because of this as well. If you're indulged in in riba, usually, you know, they say that Allah, your, your du'as are not accepted. This is something coming from hadith. The fifth thing is what impatience. We have we were so impatient, like in any other area of our lives, that you know, du'a ki hai, so it has to be done right now. Ibrahim alayhi salam, how long did he have to wait for his du'as to be manifested? Yeah. So never ever say, Allah is not listening to me. I've tried so much in front of him. I've been making this du'a for a whole year. No. Never ever give up on your, on, on your, on, you know, on what you're asking for. Unless, you know, there is an expiry. For example, you know, you're asking for good grades in your exams. Ab result nikal aya tab uske baad to, you know, obviously, you know that the result is out. So you, of course, you'll stop making du'as, but if it is for something that you kind of like, you know, it can come in your way in your life, then keep making du'as and never give up and never, never ever say that Allah is not listening to my du'as. Okay? And the last thing is what? Making conditional du'as. You know, make, saying that Allah, you know, if you will, if, if this is good for me, you know, I'm not sure... Be very, very clear. And I think I've mentioned this in the last class as, as well. Be very firm in your request. Don't worry too much about if it's good for you or not. If it's not good for you, as long as it's halal thing, if it's not good for you in this dunya or akhira, by default, Allah is not going to answer to that dua. So I don't have to take that responsibility. Okay? So these are the things. Now, yes, we can never ever follow all the things completely. Yeah, but at least let's just try as much as we can. Hamara to ye hale that we keep sinning and then expecting the best from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is so merciful that He still keeps giving. Yeah, let's not take that for granted. My effort in sorting myself out has to be there along with my duas. Okay, acha ji. Uh, now coming to the second part of this verse. It's beautiful. And devote yourself to him with exclusive devotion. Now, there are three things here to understand. The first thing is what? Uh, you know, detachment from worldly things. Superficial, basic meaning to yeah, yeah, that you have to detach yourself. And you know, here's the deal. Prophet wasallam, he had this extraordinary ability to detach himself from all kinds of worldly distractions you know, uh, when it was needed. 
there's a hadith that tells us that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be like you know in a very joyful mood you know playful with his family and the moment he would hear the call to prayer azan he would completely tune out and completely you know detach himself from whatever was going on and he would start preparing for salah so he was you know he was gifted with this you know for us this switch off and on somehow doesn't work if you're enjoying something if if you're watching something if you're reading something if you're talking to some somebody azan ho gayi acha ab karti hu ab karti hu this delay is like you know such a common thing that i see and that includes me by the way as well so we kind of like you know acha let me you know after all i have a big window of maghrib sala it is for almost like one and a half hour so what if i kind of delayed by 10 minutes or 20 minutes that's not the sunna of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would immediately kind of like you know switch off tune out and immediately focus on preparing for sala so let this be a resolution for all of us including myself ke 5 minute ka bhi delay nahi karna namaz to padhni hai na why does it have to be right at the end and a hit and go na sala let's just do it and we know it is very very rewarding if you like immediately stop whatever you even if it's like a good deed stop it and we you will only be able to kind of stop whatever is going on if your life revolves around your salawat uh somebody was asking me she said well what if you have to go for shopping and i didn't have an answer for her you know what do i do asar beech mein aage what do i do if i have to go for shopping and i was like okay <laughs> what are you supposed to do your things your planning should revolve around your five times salam and i would include your tahajjud as well because what do you need to do for tahajjud you need to sleep early ha raat ko do dafa do baje tak jaag ke and then you expect that you're going to get up in the last you know a last part of the night and you know do your tahajjud it's really not making sense and then you say you know my alarm went off and i just can't get up of course you will not be able to get up because you just slept a couple of hours back so you have to plan everything and work around your salawat right acha so um what do we learn from watabattal ilayhi tabtila i want you to picture yourself you're in a crowd right and your phone buzzes you know there is some form of a notification on your phone what do you do let's say you're in a wedding koi ceremony hai koi cheez hai there are lot of people around you what do you do immediately you kind of you know i i want you to get that feeling you completely tune out and there are times when you even miss up on what the other person was saying because you just in immediately kind of like you know focus on i kya hai and i really hope this does not happen in the class yeah right so um how about tuning out how about switching ourselves off for allah subhanahu wa taala for a few moments think about it right and ideally we should be doing this in all our salawat in all of them but of course you know there are uh, a certain unavoidable distractions that you can have during fajr zuhur asr maghrib and isha if you are a young mother your toddler is crying you know there's nobody in the house and the, you know somebody is ringing the bell it can be anything that could distract you right and there are times when i've seen young mothers keeping you know either be padh rahe and you're just kind of thinking you know i hope you know he doesn't go behind the sofa you know it happens it happens and as i told you you have to kind of prepare for your for your, for your salah and make sure that you know you don't get distracted by these things let other people know that you know i okay i'm going for my zohar make sure you take care of the little one make sure you attend the uh, you know the bell and you know telephone calls or whatever but at the time of tahajjud what the battal ilayhi tabtila is so doable how is it doable because anything that distracts you is fast asleep usually usually yeah so it is very very easy to do it so when we worship allah subhana taala we should do it with our whole hearts and mind complete focus on allah subhana taala right no partners no distractions and i'm talking about tahajjud specially 
no distractions at all. It's like, you know, having a one-on-one -on -one with, with somebody that you're very, very close to, you know, and you're completely in sync, no interruptions whatsoever. Yeah, so this is another. What about the distractions? Actually, there is one kind of distraction that can still take place at the time of tahajjud. What distraction is that? Your husband snoring? What distraction is that? Distraction from within. Distraction from within. Because you're so relaxed. And you know, if there's something bothering you, that's a good time to kind of plan and think and all of that, right? So um, if you want to, you know, uh, keep yourself completely focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you need to remind yourself at the time of the Hajar? Because when you're planning something, what do you plan for? Some kind of future, some kind of success, some kind of achievement in this dunya, usually. Yay planning, Otina. So how about you keep reminding yourself at time of tahajjud when you're doing your salah that there is nothing in this dunya, right? Having the power to grant your wishes, not at all. There's nothing in this dunya who can solve your problems, right? Not even your own little head, your own ideas and plans, none, none of the above, except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my planning should be so secondary, right? Uh, nothing can help you, not your boss, not your bank account, and surely not your favorite chocolate, none of the above. Nothing, nothing. It's all about putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your planning has to be shared with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And let him plan for you. He knows what you want. And this is the time to make du'as. If you want any kind of planning, it should be in the form of du'as. Right? And when you do your, when do you do your du'a in your sujood? Before your salam. Even otherwise, you can sit and keep praying. You can do that. Now, uh, you know, the second thing, you might be thinking, uh, hold on, does this mean that I have to give up everything and you go and live in a cave like a monk? Hmm? No, not at all. So Quran makes it very, very clear that monasticism and this whole idea of abandoning, uh, you know, the worldly pleasures is not the path for us. It's not for us Muslims at all. So we can't really cut off ties, cut off relationships and call it worship. It's anything but worship. It's not worship. Islam is very, very balanced, you know. So the third thing is what? That you actually can have your cake and eat it too. You can. But understand that, you know, eating the cake is not the ultimate source of happiness. That's the only thing you and I need to remember. Enjoy this dunya, but that should not be the ultimate reason for living. Right. So you can be an amazing spouse, an amazing daughter, an amazing wife and, you know, professional student, you name it and still be deeply connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. In fact, being, uh, you know, a better person in your relationships with everybody around you, uh, you know, is part and parcel of what the battal ilahi tabitila during the day. During the day, whatever you do. It is what the battal ilahi tabidila from one aspect. And what's that? That you're in a mode of worship. You're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're doing something for a good reason. There's a reason behind why you're going out for lunch with your friend. There's a reason why you're kind of, you know, calling people over. There's a reason why you're chit-chatting with your mother-in-law on the phone. Anything that you do has to be connected, you know, dotted lines to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, it becomes what? It becomes ibada. It becomes ibada. So it's basically during, uh, you know, it is, it's like having, you know, multiple tabs open in your life's browser. There are a lot of tabs open and that's fine. As long as that one tab that is named as Allah should always be open, right? Should always be active. So during the day, what the batal ilahi tabitila is what? The, you know, the, the example that I gave you of multiple tabs and Allah's tab is always very active and what the battal ilahi tabitila during night is what? Just Allah's tab is open. How beautiful it is. 
So round the clock, you're in mode of what? Connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Right. Acha. Now, now here's the riddle. And I'm going to try and explain this to you without taking you uh, into any kind of grammatical analysis and linguistic analysis. In Arabic language, there is a way um, of combining two meanings, you know, into a phrase. You can derive two meanings out of one phrase, right? So when you say what the batal ilahi the way this this is this is structured, it has two connotations. And the first is quite obvious that you disconnect yourself with everything around you and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? But what is the second thing? When you do this, by doing this, what are you doing? You are facilitating others to disconnect themselves with everything and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, you know, you will set an example of how to disconnect uh, with people when it's really needed, right? And if you're going to do that, you will be kind of encouraging other people. I'll give you an example. You're, you know, at a party and it's time for Maghrib Salah. You're a little unsure if you really want to go and do your Salah or not for the wrong reasons, right? But everybody gets up and goes. So who will you socialize with? And you'll say, oh, I might as well go and do my namaz as well. So when you are in this process of what are you doing? You're actually helping others to follow good steps. You're encouraging others to kind of understand that there are times when you need to learn how to switch off from, from the world and you want to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Acha. Now, I told you two parts, Vaskurisma Rabbik and Watabatil Ilehi Tabitila. These are basically what? Two steps, you know, uh, in, in your journey. They are, you know, first, what do you do? You Watabatil Ilehi Tabitila is something that you do first. You detach and then you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's ulta, right? And I was trying to figure out why it is I couldn't. So maybe I'll read up a little more on it and I maybe the scholars have come up with the reason as to why first Allah SWT talks about maskurisma rabbik and watabatalilaitabitila. But actually what's happening is you disconnect and then you're connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Maybe there's another meaning because scholars they come up with various multiple meanings for one verse. Anyways. So the thing is that, you know, when you detach yourself from everything around you, it is literally like, you know, you're peeling off uh, layers of onion. Right? That's what you're doing. And then you connect deeply with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So basically, these two parts are, you know, two sides of the same coin. You can't do one without the other. They're very important. Are you with me on this? Yeah. Okay. So the key is in these two simple basic sentences that you remember the name of your Lord and you kind of devote yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, exclusive devotion. So in this, basically what we see that Prophet wasallam is cutting himself off uh, from the society at what time? Especially at night time, because it's easiest to cut off from everything at night time. Now here I would like to share, you know, uh, I would call it foundation of Dawa. But I'm, I didn't want to use that because somehow I've noticed whenever you talk about dawa, people, some of some of you might just I say, okay, this is time for me to relax because I'm still struggling in my, you know, practices. Dawa, wawa, to, you know, bade ka kaam hai. You know, so this is one time, oh, thank God. I mean, I can just like chill now and just like relax. No, we need to understand that this concept of dawa has to be in our lives. At what level? There are multiple levels, right? What the scholars do is dawa, and what you can do with one of your friends, one of your colleagues, one of your relatives, somebody, you know, one of your servants is also dawa. And this is a responsibility that has been bestowed on us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have to realize that. I can't say, oh, I'm Abito, I'm struggling myself. You know, I'm in no position to tell anybody about Salat. Yes, you are. Because there are times 
And I've, I've actually experienced this myself. When you talk about something, right? It reinforces, reiterates those concepts in your head first. So you have no idea how beneficial these classes are for me. They are actually, they are. If you're telling somebody to pray Maghrib Salah, for example, and you still, and you yourself are a little lukewarm, eventually you'll say, what am I doing? So the, the solution is not to stop saying it. The solution is what? Start doing it. Start doing it. Right? So what is the foundation of Dawa? Yes. I just, I just want to uh, say something that when you uh, ask somebody to pray in the best manner, mm -hmm. or you try to encourage them. Yes. But I think the society has become as such that if people either they point that you may have now to me, or they, uh, they say, yeah, you know, yeah, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. Even when you are saying it in the nicest manner, mm -hmm. you just want mm -hmm. to really discourage them to encourage anyone else. Right? I know. The level of tolerance for anybody coming up to you and saying anything has really gone down. It's not just in religion. It's in everything. You're cooking and somebody will come and say something. Oh, Piaz, ko you karna hai brown? You'll say, I know what I'm doing. So it's, and you tell your child, you know, let me give you, let me teach you a simpler way of doing this sum. And you'll say, Ma, I know how to do it. So it's not just religion. You know, as, as a society, we have kind of like losing out on our tolerance for each other. Having said that, does that kind of put, can that put me off the hook that, you know, kya kya kare? I mean, I, I, can't, I have tried. A, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the wisdom. B, there are multiple ways of saying things, right? Uh, you're telling your friend, you know, how about you start your Maghrib Salah? But tell me something. If in front of my child or in front of my friends, if I get up for my Maghrib Salah, is this also a form of dawa? It is. And nobody would say, hey, what are you trying to say? Nobody would. Nobody would say anything. But the person, if he has you know, any inclination towards deen or he's fearful of Allah, he's going to kind of pick on those uh, things. And I don't know how many times when I was going through my journey, uh, people came up to me and they said, you know, if, uh, I thought that if you can do it, I can do it too. You don't realize it. When there's a party going on and you get up and you go and do your salah, you don't know how many, uh, and especially if in, a, in the Muslim society, you have no idea how uncomfortable you're making the rest of them over there. So if you feel that they don't have the tolerance for it, then they will find another way. The idea is not to put them off because if they're ticked off, what's going to happen? They're going to shut down. Whenever they see your face, then they're going to kind of like, okay? So that's not the purpose. And we are going to do Hajran Jamila. It's going to come in the next verse. How you have to kind of make sure that you don't burn your bridges, bridges with people. In, for the sake of dava, that's not really dava, that's suicidal, right? So you have to learn and it comes with time. The first time, you know, when I, when I became religious practicing, you know, I had like a very straightforward black and white way of going and telling things to people. And then slowly and gradually, I, I realized it's not working. And then you find, you know, milder ways of kind of, you know, subtle messages here and there and not all the time. It's not every time I get up for my maghrib and I just look look at my friend. No, you know, so Allah and ask Allah to teach you, guide you and give you wisdom. Take it, inshallah. So. Yes. You know, the three A that she that I would justify and and not in a way direct, but very subtly. I just want to be able to speak one another and just the time. And I'm just taking it. Mm -hmm. So I really ask Allah to make a very subtle in the but let me leave a positive impact. When they leave me from a positivity, I may not Very good. Very good. This is how I hope uh, my online students were able to hear her. Is your is your mic open over there? So I'm sorry, your name? Peza. Peza. The word Peza. Peza. Peza is saying 
that you know she she's got her own subtle ways of let me just share a tip with you especially in our society if you want to do dawa the safest dawa is what foolproof dawa talk about some fit issue you know tell them you know do this so many times so please don't make it up because that would be bidda innovation we don't want to get into that but you know to share something like that with them you know i um, uh, i go to these uh, yoga classes and you know the women who are coming there are clueless about a lot of things so my way you know the way i speak to them is like you know talking about some kind of thing some tasbihah you know, just like generally speaking you know about uh if if it's month of muharram and i'll just say something about muharram and you know how fasting is good on the 9th and 10th just a little bit here there and they then slowly and gradually they start start showing interest you know just like a subtle thing as if like you know you know this right so i'm not you know my attitude is not let me just tell you something really interesting it's like of course you know this right you know and then this and no we don't <laughs> so create that interest in them let them reach out to you and i don't know it's not easy this is the voice of the mind is near you acha so uh, feza feza said that you know she uh, she's got a group of friends and she wants to like we talked about it during the day also whatever you're doing it should be converted into ibadah so what she does is she would kind of say something during her meeting with her friends something that will kind of be beneficial from them for them from religious perspective and uh, and they're not kind of you know repelled or they're not feeling kind of like you know they don't feel put off you know yeah mulani ya ye kind of a thing yeah you don't want that label on you so you need to kind of be very very wise in order to make sure that people don't start start calling you mulani right and you have to go very very slow what's the rush what's the rush as long as you have the intention as like a like a baby step one thing at a time alhamdulillah and as watching and you have the intention i know there are times when i have i'm all prepared to go and say something you know in a gathering and i'm not able to do that i don't get that opportunity but allah knows that i was i was all prepared but it's just it just that i felt if i'm going to say it i'm going to miss out on an opportunity so i prefer waiting for another uh, you know uh, situation where i can say something to them and that's fine as long as you're struggling as long as long as you're rehearsing as long as you're kind of concern and going to um, you know a gathering or group of friends with an intention that you know kuch mujhe idhar udhar kuch touches dene hain uh, that's fine inshallah taala ji uh, please don't help with them reach out to them and uh, once uh, like when they need uh, they are going to give your hair to them and help them like this is really helps in our work very good point malaika is saying that you know we think my responsibility is to make sure ke ye maghrib ki namaz padh le for example right what about things that they want to share with you right and what about what kind of impression do they have about you we are everything but a good human being i'm very sorry to say we become we are so kind of you know our personalities are so people i don't know how, how to put it especially practicing people we guys have to be very very careful that we are not giving wrong messages to the other people person because they are already kind of like you know in awe somehow without you realizing it but if you are going to not reach out to them help them and you know making them love you for 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 what you are as a human being before anything else it's not going to work you might be the most pious person doing tahajjud and doing five times prayers and fasting on mondays and thursdays and everything but if your overall personality is not uh, you know um friendly enough helpful enough it's not going to work these are basic prerequisites to bolte hai na oh just be a good person it starts with being a good person but it doesn't stop there that's the only thing that you know where we kind of differ with this opinion we are we also agree being a good person is the beginning but it does not stop there then you have to surely be a good muslim as well and understand your responsibility that is coming from allah subhanahu wa taala right you were saying something ji uh, sometimes i also feel that uh, you know because i'm just learning or striving towards mm -hmm. or trying to understand so maybe i'm because i'm not in a position to to invite anyone else 
Never, never think that. Never think that. Because what Allah expects from you is that whatever you're understanding, you sh you're not imparting, you're not teaching, you're sharing. You're sharing. And you're sharing with people who are receptive to it. Pakar pakar ke maar maar ke nahi baat karni unse. But you will find somebody in your group, somebody in your family who's kind of interested in knowing, Acha, what did you learn in the class today? Right? And when you are going to kind of share what you learn, you'll feel that you know your, your faith is strengthening from within. So never ever think that, you know, oh, I'm just a beginner and therefore, you know, dawa comes later on. No, dawa comes with your practice. And you'll see how, you know, you, you will be making a very, very powerful virtue circle for your cycle for yourself, inshallah, because of this, right? So do think, do understand your responsibility. And I said that I'm going to share a golden rule. Uh, I've got just like three minutes. Let's see how much I can do, inshallah ta'ala. It is ayah number nine. Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghrib la ilaha illahu. He is the Lord of the East and the West. There is no God but He. Fattakhith hu wakila. So take Him for your guardian. Take Him as the one who takes care of all your problems. Wakila. Urdu mein kehte na wakil. What is wakil? Lawyer. What does a lawyer do? Huh? He takes care. He takes care of your issues, right? Wakila is what? Allah subhanahu leave your issues, your problems to Allah subhanahu ta'ala to take care of. Wakil. You said tawakkul. Tawakkul on Allah. What is tawakkul? It's coming from the same word wakil. So, you know, let Allah take care of your problems, right? So, tawakkul is that I, basically what does tawakkul Allah mean? That I'm relying on Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Take care. Now, what does this mean for us? Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghrib. I want to, uh, I want you to imagine that you are about to, uh, you know, start a road trip from one end to the furthest other end of this dunya. Can you imagine? Maybe from East Coast to West Coast. But to come here, anyways, and you're doing it for the first time. Okay? So you're embarking on this journey for the first time. It's a long journey from East Coast to West Coast. Acha. Um, now, you would not trust just anybody to be your GPS. Right? You would. Um, you would want somebody who's reliable, somebody who knows all the, the right shortcuts in your route, somebody who can navigate you till you reach your destination. Isn't that so? You're going for the first time. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, wakila. what he's saying is that he's not just any GPS. Who is he? He's the Lord of the East. He's the Lord of the West. Right? So there is no more, nobody more reliable. There's nobody more trustworthy than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take him as your ultimate GPS in your life. Right? Let him, you know, let him take care of your affairs. Let him take care of your decisions. Rely on him and let him take care of your worries as well. It's beautiful. Inshallah, I'll stop here. Um, and inshallah, I'm going to kind of continue with this uh, in the next class. Um, just a small point that I mentioned before, I've got just like a half a minute. Um, uh, if you were to ever hand over the steering wheel of your life, who would it be? Who would it be? Who knows all the ways, the shortcuts, the pit shops, right? Okay. So here, when life gets tough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Rab, you've done Rab with Shala today. Rabbul Mashrati wal he, he has everything in control. He can answer to your questions. He can take care of your worries. So trust me in it. Right? Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Aizzati Amma Yasifun Wa Salaamun Ala Al Mursaleen Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu